All set, Norm. Mary had a little lamb. Her fleece was white as snow. Are you scared yet? Okay. So, uh, oh, and here comes Mary. Watch out. So, with the smoke and everything, the last week or so, I feel like I've been living in a Weber barbecue, so my voice just kind of comes and goes. Hopefully that'll work. But uh, tonight, I want to read from Dark Harvest, which is my favorite novel I've written and, and probably my favorite thing to read from. And when you write horror, one of the things that people tend to ask you is, uh, oh, well, uh, why horror? And what they're really kind of saying is, uh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but in a polite way. And, and I, could, I could tell you, but that would take too long to explain all that. Um, but I can't explain what, what attracted me to horror in the first place. And that was, uh, I grew up as, in Vallejo and uh, kind of tail end baby, baby boomer generation. Uh, a lot of people in town were ex-Navy because the shipyard was still there at the time. My, my dad uh, had gotten out of the Navy in uh, San Diego, drove up to the Bay Area, ended up uh, getting a job as a truck driver and came from Pennsylvania and said, I never want to go home and shovel snow again. So that's how he ended up here. Same way with a, leather, a lot of other people in town. They'd come, come to town for jobs during World War II and just ended up staying. So when I was a kid, we'd have neighborhood barbecues and uh, then the charcoals would start to die down and the dads in the neighborhood would start to tell ghost stories. And we had some pretty good ghost story uh, tellers in the neighborhood. Uh, my dad told really good ones. He grew up in Pennsylvania, like I said, and he'd tell the story of a, uh, a house in town that was abandoned and there'd been a murder there and there was a bloody footprint that would appear on the staircase in the moonlight and uh, of course he and his friends went in the house one moonlit night to see if this was true saw the bl bloody footprint appear and then started to hear footsteps upstairs so that got my attention and it was the, the immediacy of stories like that that really attracted me to horror in the first place um, so when i wrote dark harvest what i wanted to do was kind of see if i could capture that kind of immediacy of an, in a novel. So I kind of wanted to write a campfire story that was masquerading as a novel. Um, and that's what I'm going to read from, from tonight. The only other thing I'll say before I get started was my dad was a truck driver. And uh, around our house, profanity was a little bit like punctuation. Every sentence uh, needed just a little bit of it. So if we go off into that a little bit, I hope you'll forgive me. Okay. So, so when I wrote the beginning of this, I literally kind of wanted just to grab you and pull you into this strange little world. And uh, let me just kick it off. A Midwestern town, you know its name. You were born there. It's Halloween 1963 and getting on towards dark. Things are the same as they've always been. There's the main street, the old brick church in the town square, the movie theater, this year with a Vincent Price double bill. And past all that is the road that leads out of town. It's black as a licorice whip under an October sky, black as the night that's coming and the long winter nights that will follow, black as the little town it leaves behind. The road grows narrow as it hits the outskirts. It does not meander. Like a planned path of escape that cleaves a sea of quarter sections planted thick with summer corn. But it's not summer anymore. Like I said, it's Halloween. All that corn's been picked, shucked, eaten. All those stalks are dead, withered, dried. In most places, those stalks would have been plowed under long ago. That's not the way it works around here. You remember, corn's harvested by hands in these parts. Boys who live in the town spend their summers doing the job under a blazing sun that barely bothers to go down. And once those boys are tanned straight through and that crop's picked, those corn stalks die rooted in the ground. They're not plowed under until the first day of November. 
Until then, the silent rows are home to things that don't mind living among the dead. Rats, snakes, frogs, creatures that will take flight before the first light of the coming morning or die beneath a circular blade that scores both earth and flesh without discrimination. Yeah, that's the way it works around here. There are things living in these fields tonight that will, by rights, be dead by tomorrow morning. One of them hangs on a splintery pole, its roots burrowing deep in rich black soil. Green vines climb through tattered clothes nailed to the pole in its cross piece. They twist through the legs of worn jeans like tendons, twine like a cripple's spine through tattered denim, denim jacket. Rounded leaves take sucker from those vines like organs fed by blood vessels. And from the hearts of those leaves, green tendrils sprout. And the leaves and the vines and the tendrils fill up that coat and the arms that come with it. A thicker vine creeps through the neck of that jacket, following the last few inches of splintery pole like a backbone, widening into a rough stem that roots in the thing balanced on the pole's flat crown. That thing is heavy and orange and ripe. That thing is a pumpkin. The afternoon sun lingers on the pumpkin's face, and then the afternoon sun is gone. Quiet hangs in the cornfield. No breeze rustles the dead stalks. No wind rustles the tattered clothes of the thing hanging from the pole. The licorice whip road is empty, silent, still. No cars coming into town. No cars leaving. It's that way for a long time. Then darkness falls. A car comes, a door slams, footsteps in the cornfield, the sound of a man shouldering through brittle stalks, the butcher knife that fills his hand gleams beneath the rising moon, and then the blade goes black as the man bends low. Twisted vines and young creepers root at the base of the pole. The man's sharp blade severs all. Next he goes to work with a claw hammer. Rusty nails grunt loose from old wood. A tattered leg slips free, then another, then a tattered arm. The thing they call the October boy drops to the ground. But you already know about him. After all, you grew up here. There aren't any secrets left for you. You know the story as well as I do. Pete McCormick knows the story too, part of it anyway. Pete just turned 16. He's, he's been in town his whole life, but he's never managed to fit in. And the last year has been especially tough. His mom died of cancer last winter, and his dad drank away his job at the grain elevator the following spring. There's enough rotten luck in that little sentence to bust anyone's chops. So it's not like the walls have never closed in on Pete around here, but just lately they've been jamming his shoulders like he's caught in a drill press. He gets in trouble a couple of times and gets picked up by the cops. Good old Officer Ricks in his shiny black and white Dodge. First time around, it's a lecture. Second time, it's a nightstick to the kidneys. Pete comes home all bruised up and pisses blood for a couple of days. He waits for his old man to slam him back in line the way he would have before the whole world hit, hit a wall, maybe take a hunk out of that bastard Ricks while he's at it. But his father doesn't even say a word, so Pete figures, well, it looks like you're finally on your own, Charlie Brown. And what are you going to do about that? For Pete, it's your basic wake-up call. Once and for all, he decides he doesn't much care for his podunk hometown. Doesn't like all that corn, doesn't like all that quiet. Sure as hell doesn't like Officer Ricks. And maybe he's not so crazy about his father, either. Summer rolls around, and the old man starts hitting the bottle pretty steady. Could be he's noticed the changes in his son because he starts telling stories. All of a sudden, he's really big with the stories. We'll get back on our feet soon, Pete. They'll call me back to work at the elevator. That gets to be one of Pete's favorites. Right up there with, I'm going to quit the drinking, son, for you and for your sister. I promise I'll quit it soon. It's like the old man has a fish on the line, and he's trying to reel it in with words. But Pete gets tired of listening. He's smart enough to know that words don't matter unless you're walking the hard road that leads to the truth. And sure, he can understand what's going on. Sure, the nightstick that life put to his old man makes the solid hunk of oak Officer Ricks 
used to bust up Pete look like a toothpick. But understanding all that doesn't make listening to his old man's pipe dreams any easier. And that's what his father's words turn out to be. The boss man down at the elevator never calls and the old man's drinking doesn't stop and things don't get any better for them. Things just keep on getting worse. As summer wanes, Pete often catches himself daydreaming about that licorice whip road that leads out of town. He wonders what it would be like out there somewhere else, far away from here, on his own. And pretty soon that road finds its way into another story making the rounds because, hey, it's September now, and it's about time folks started, started in on that one crazy yarn everyone around here spins at that time of year. Pete, Pete catches bits of it around town, first from a couple of football players waiting to get their flat tops squared at the barber shop, later from a bunch of guys standing in line at the movie theater one hot Saturday night. And pretty soon the story picks up steam at the high school too. Again, Pete only hears snatches of it. In the bathroom out back of the auto shop where guys go to sneak cigarettes, in detention hall after school, and sure, it's pretty crazy stuff, but the craziest thing is th that those snatches of conversation all fall within the same parameters. And that simple fact is enough to start Pete thinking that this might be the rare kind of story that actually makes the trip from the campfire to the cold, hard street. Pete's been thinking about those conversations for the last few days, putting them together with all the other stories he's heard adding it up one way, then adding it up another just to see if he can make it come out any other way than the crazy spook show equation it wears for a face. And hey, just lately Pete's had plenty of time to think about all that stuff because it's the tail end of October now and his father's had him locked in his bedroom for the last five days. Nothing to eat in there, only water to drink and when the old man's feeling generous, maybe a glass of OJ that's a long way from fresh squeezed. You want sufficient opportunity to become a believer? Well, there you go. Try feeding a five-day hunger with some OJ that tastes like a cup of freezer burn and nothing to wash it down but a bunch of words you can't get out of your head. But even with all that chewing around inside him, Pete can't quite buy into the stories he's been hearing. Oh sure, he can believe the part about kids and the crazy stuff they get up to with their baseball bats and pitchforks on Halloween night. After his run-in with Officer Ricks, he's certain his hayseed home count could breed a nasty little square dance like that. But the other part, the spook show part, Pete's not so sure he can make the whole trip there. And you can't really blame him, can you? I mean, think about it. Remember when you were just a little kid? The first time you noticed your old, older brother locked up tight for five days and nights during the last week of October? Remember the first time you heard the whole deal had something to do with the pumpkin-headed scarecrow that runs around on Halloween night? It wasn't exactly easy to believe that one, no matter how scared you were, was it? Not until you experienced it yourself, of course. Until you were the kid locked up in that bedroom until you were the kid who saw what went down when you hit the streets on Halloween night. But Pete hasn't seen any of that, not yet. Like I said, he just turned 16. Tonight's his first crack at the run. So it's not really surprising that his disbelief isn't completely suspended, but he's getting there. And the more Pete thinks about it, the less important the whole spook show equation seems. The way Pete sees it, what he believes or disbelieves doesn't really matter much when you look at the big picture. Do that and other stuff starts to matter. Uh-huh. What matters is that his old man has kept him locked up for five days. What matters is that he hasn't had anything to eat. What matters is that he's dead cold certain it's been just that way for every other guy in town between the ages of 16 and 19. The high school is closed has been for five days, the streets are empty, and guys all over town are pacing cracker box bedrooms in the wee small hours, gearing up for Halloween night like bulls pepped up, penned up in tight little chutes. Pete sits on his bed and thinks about that. Right about now, it seems like a pretty full bucket of validation. So he lets his mind tote that sucker and he gets comfortable with the load. 
If he thinks about baseball bats and pitchforks and butcher knives and two by fours studded with nails and a couple hundred young guys hitting the streets as darkness falls. He thinks about a scarecrow running around with a pumpkin for a head. He thinks about what running down that scarecrow might mean to a guy like him. Then, as the old Waltham clock on his nightstand ticks down the dying embers of Halloween evening, he stops thinking about all that stuff. After that, he only thinks about a couple of things, the really important things. He thinks about the door to his bedroom swinging open. He thinks about what he'll do when he steps outside. Okay, so that's kind of the start, and that introduces pretty much the two main characters in the book, which is the October Boy and Pete. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. This is where the ritual of the run itself begins. And the October Boy is heading for town, and the other boys are starting to hunt him, inclu including three boys who are in a car who have decided to get to the outskirts of town and get the first shot of him. And uh, these aren't nice guys, they're bullies. And uh, we'll get around to showing you what happens to bullies in a Norm Partridge book. <laughs> but uh, they have pitchforks. The, the other thing about this section was there's part buried in here about midway through, which is really the most fun I've ever had writing because uh, I, I, one of big influence on me when I was a kid was watching the old Twilight Zone show. So there was a part in this novel where I just needed to uh, kind of encapsulate exactly what was going on. And if you've seen those old Twilight Zones, you'll get the first two, three minutes, build up to some strange little thing going on, and then Rod Serling will just step out in his black suit, smoking his cigarette, and he'll give you this little come on in his very clipped kind of voice. And I can't do that voice, but I wish I could. But anyway, the most fun I ever had writing was writing what's going on in my novel the way Rod Serling might have said it. So, so this is, starts off with these kids, uh, Mitch Crenshaw and his buddies in, in this car. The cigarette sails through the window and kicks up a hail of sparks as, it, as if hitting something solid out there in the darkness. But Mitch Crenshaw doesn't pay any attention to that. He knows there's nothing outside his window but the night and a shitload of dead corn stalks and a pumpkin-headed monster he's ready to carve up for Halloween pie. So Mitch does what he does best. He hits the gas and drives straight ahead. He flicks the headlights to high beam and they cut the belly right out of the sky and he races along the gash feeling like a guy who's just about to butt heads with his very own destiny which is exactly what he's going to do. And in this case, Mitch knows that destiny doesn't stand a chance. The way Mitch figures it, he's the only guy in town who's smarter than the average bear. Being behind the wheel of the only car on this road proves that. This year, Mitch has it all figured out and, slow down, Mitch, Bud Harris says. You ain't going to have a chance to kill the boy if you kill us first. Yeah, it's Charlie Gunther now, chiming in from the back seat, seat like a goddamn alarm clock. Ease off, buddy. You keep the hammer slammed and we're liable to miss the whole damn field, let alone old hacksaw face. We ain't going to miss nothing, Mitch says sharply, and his booted foot stays right there on the gas. Because he knows he's right and he's not afraid to say, say it. Not tonight. Not when he's been locked up in a room for five days without a thing to eat. Not when hunger's burning a hole in his belly and his brain is clicking away over time. No, there's no room for argument on Mitch's agenda. Tonight the run belongs to him, and it's his game. His second crack at the October boy, and this time he's going to get it right. Mitch doesn't really count last year anyway. Last Halloween he was just two days past his 16th birthday. He didn't even have a driver's license. But this year, things are different. This year, he's 17, and he's got a Chrysler and a switchblade knife and some other dangerous implements in the truck that'll spell T-R-O-U-B-L-E for anyone who gets in his way. But most of all, he's got the whole deal figured out good. Hey, I ain't kidding, Charlie says from the back seat. I think we missed the field. We better turn around or someone else is going to beat us to the boy. Didn't you hear me the first time, Mitch snaps? We didn't miss the goddamn field. And no one's going to beat us to nothing. 
I mean, have you ever even heard of anyone doing what we're doing tonight? You ever hear of anyone jumping the line? No, Mitch, but no buts, stupid. I've got it all figured out. Those other dipsticks always treat the run like it's a game of hide and seek. They hang around town waiting for the boy to come after his ollie ollie oxen free. They don't bust the city limits. But this ain't the way we're going to play it tonight. We're going to take the run straight to our buddy Sawtooth Jack, and I'm going to splatter his ass before he even gets a chance to step across the line. But what if it don't work? What if the boy gets past us somehow? You know, Charlie, there are two little words that can get your ass kicked out of this car. One of them's what, the other's if. <laughs> Mitch shoots a glance at the rear view, eyeballing the dope in the back seat. Charlie's sitting there with a mighty Thor comic book rolled up in his hands, and he looks like he just got whacked over the head with the big guy's hammer. And that's the way Charlie should look as far as Mitch is concerned. The way Mitch sees it, tonight you can screw what if, and second guesses too. There's no room on Mitch's plate for any of that. He's up for a one course meal and that means winning the run. Then everything will be different for him. Sure, the town will get what it wants, what it needs to get through another year of raising prize cops from the same old dirt, what it needs to turn those crops into cold hard cash. The whole deal delivered with a king size platter of blessings from above or below, depending on who the hell you listen to. Mitch sees it this way. You can have the blessings wherever they come from. He doesn't have a clue how anyone could settle for life in this nothing little place, and he won't need one after tonight. Not after he bashes that living jack-o'-lantern's head into the pavement and carves those candy bars out of its woven vine chest. That happens, the whole damn town can bury their favorite spook story in the bottom drawer and forget about it for another year, the way they always do. Until the calendar flips a bunch of pages and another crop gets picked and shucked. Until another pumpkin starts growing in that same dead field. Until someone drives out there one night, hammers together a cross, <coughs> and nails up an empty suit of clothes <clears throat> for a fresh tangle of growing vines to fill. Okay. But Mitch, Mitch Crenshaw will be go long gone by the time that happens. Once he nails old Hacksaw face, things will be different for him. Once he eats himself some of the candy that serves up its heartbeat, there won't be anyone to stand in his way. Yeah, bring down Saw Sawtooth Jack and he'll be the winner. That means a whole hell of a lot, both for him and his family. The family will get treated differently around here. They'll get a new house, a new car. They won't see a bill for a year, not at the grocery store, no mortgage payments, nothing. That'll make Mitch's old man particularly happy. But Mitch doesn't care about his hard-ass father or his shrew of a mother or his snot little sisters. No, Mitch pretty, pretty much just cares about himself and what winning the run will get him. Do that and he'll grab a pocket full of green just like Jim Shepard did last year. Even better, he'll be on this road again, headed out of town like a bullet, and for the very last time. Guys like Charlie and Bud, they, they couldn't even handle that. Wouldn't want to win. Wouldn't want to see their hometown in the rear view. Wouldn't know what to do if they could. Hell, they'd probably break down in tears, run screaming for mommy and daddy if someone kicked their asses across the line for good. That's why those guys aren't built to win the run. But Mitch is. Winning the run is the only way to get out of this squirrel cage of a town and Mitch wants it so bad he can taste it. Hunger burns in his belly and burns in his brain. He wants that money in his pocket, wants everything that comes with it, wants the town in his rear view, wants to see what's down that black road and across those dead fields and out there in the world. So that's Mitch's game. You remember how it feels, don't you? All that desire scorching you straight through, feeling like you're penned up in a small town cage, jailed by cornstalk bars, knowing, just knowing, that you'll be stuck in that quiet little town forever if you don't take a chance. So you know what it's like to want to fly down the road and see what lies beyond it. To want that so bad, you'll do just about anything to make it happen. Sure, you remember Mitch Crenshaw's game, the same way you remember that it isn't the only one running tonight. Glance over at the side of that black road and you'll see undeniable evidence of that. Might not be any little guy standing in there, there in a black suit 
to set up the story for you the way there is every Friday night on TV. <clears throat> but like that little guy says, every near, damn near every week, there's a signpost up ahead. Even if it ain't a hunk of metal you can touch, it's written on the darkness and it tells us that we've got a few hard miles of prime time Twilight Zone action ahead on this road tonight. Picture, if you will, the flip side of a game played by a pack of teenage hoodlums in a rusty Chrysler. It's a solo B-side for a thing born in a cornfield, a requiem for the shambling progeny of the black and bloody earth. Because the October boy has his own game. It's played with pitchforks and switchblades and fear, and its first scrimmage is set to begin on a quiet strip of two lane that marks the midnight trail to town. For this creature with the fright mask face is both trick and treat. He comes with pockets filled with candy, and he carries a knife that carves holes in the shadows, and his race will take him from a lonely country road to an old brick church that waits dead center in the middle of a town square in the twilight zone. <coughs> uh-huh, that about covers it if you want the teaser. Hang around for 30 minutes and we'll give you the payoff and the show can kick into gear right about here. The October boy spots the Chrysler's Gorgon headlights about a mile off, but he doesn't freeze. He makes for the side of the road and dugs into a clutch of corn stalks that close around him like a skeletal fist. He stands there with the butcher knife vined in his gnarled grasp, waiting as light grows larger, thinking, planning. His thoughts aren't so different from those of the boy behind the Chrysler's wheel because the October boy has his own game to play and has played with a deck that's stacked against him. Yeah, if there's one thing the October boy knows, it's that. But he doesn't have another way to go tonight. He's already crossed the starting line. And there's nowhere to head but to the finish, though he can't imagine how he'll get there. It seems impossible. How he'll make it from this spot into town and how he'll run the teenage gauntlet that's itching to chop him down like a two-legged weed, and how he'll reach that finish line church in the town square before the steeple bell tolls midnight, well, it's be, gotta be the longest of all long shots. It never happens that way. Everyone in town says it can't happen that way. But the October boy has to make it happen that way if he wants to win. So the boy thinks about how he'll play it not long range, but step by step. He hears the Chrysler's engine now. Here's too the cool October breeze rushing in the car's wake as the Chrysler speeds through dead corn a quarter mile away. He sucks a breath through his arrowhead nose and steadies himself. The car is coming fast. Forget miles, we're talking yards now. And the October boy is already moving. He slips free of that corn stock fist clutching the knife in his hands, racing through the ditch and up the incline, severed root feet scrabbling over blacktop as he hits the road and crosses the white line. The boy's head swivels as the Chrysler closes in on him. He strains for a glimpse of the driver's face through the windshield, but the window's as black as the night. The boy can't see anyone behind it. His carved eyes flicker in the darkness, the dead white headlines don't flicker at all. So, as you can imagine, there's a confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's over, uh, it turns out that Bud and Charlie are pretty much disposable characters. They don't really <laughs> hang around too long. And uh, one other thing, the, when it's over, the October boy has the pitchfork. And, uh, Mitch Crenshaw is about to find out what it's like to come face to face with a legend. So. Okay. For a second it's quiet. The stars shine down, the wind doesn't even whisper. Then the October boy bends low and picks up Bud's pitchfork. Mitch yanks his switchblade, thumbs the release, and starts to backpedal as the blade snicks alive in the night. He knows he can't panic. Maybe he doesn't need to panic. He's still got the knife and Bud's got one too. That means the odds are still two to one and behind him there's another chorus of snap, crackle, pop. 
Mitch whirls. Bud's nowhere in sight, but you can hear him plowing a path through the cornfield, running away. The son of a bitch, he ditched me. But Mitch doesn't have time to worry about Bud. The October boy is advancing. Mitch is on the retreat. You can't really blame him. He doesn't think much of putting down money on a one-on-one switchblade pitchfork rumble with a monster. Not when he's still got a set of car keys in his pocket, and not when he's got 20 feet of black top on the October boy. Yeah, he can make it to the Chrysler before Sawtooth Jack catches up to him. Sure he can. He moves fast, careful to keep those 20 paces between them, because the boy has the pitchfork. Mitch wants to have plenty of time to get out of the way if the boy throws it. But now Mitch has retreated far enough so that he's in the glow of the Chrysler's headlights, and that means he's one hell of a target. And he, he can't keep backpedaling either because suddenly the October boy is starting to close the gap. The hell with this, Mitch figures. I'll take my chances. I'll get my point, myself pointed in the right direction and launch my ass like a mercury rocket. And he does just that. He turns and his legs start pumping and he runs for the light. And he's smart. He doesn't look back. He's not going to take the chance because he doesn't want to see that goddamn monster closing in on him with a nightmare stride like this Wilt Chamberlain times two. Doesn't want to see that grim light spilling out of its hacked up head like some crazy quilt headlight as it freight trains his ass. Doesn't want to do anything but pick him up and put him down till he's safe and secure behind the wheel of the Chrysler, knifing the key into that thick neck of a steering column, twisting it sharply as his foot pile drives the gas and he peels out, leaving five bucks worth of rubber there on the road, slamming that running nightmare head on, threshing its scarecrow ass like a big old combine, grinding it under his firestones until there's nothing left but a smear of pumpkin and chocolate on the two-lane blacktop. Uh Uh-huh, that's what Mitch Crenshaw wants. He's halfway to the car now, holding on to his resolve like a relay runner's baton. He's not going to look over his shoulder no matter what, but as it turns out, he doesn't have to, because he's got a handful of senses besides the one attached to his eyeballs, and they tell him exactly what's going on behind him. First, Mitch's ears do the work. He hears the crazy whisk broom sound of the October boy's feet brushing the road. And then that even rhythm hits another tempo and changes up. A couple of quick severed steps, a staccato rasp of physical effort. And then Mitch's body takes over and does the sensory work. A hot spike of pain spears the back of his right ankle, ripping a path that notches bone, breaking skin as it exits his ankle and drives down through his boot and the foot inside. The damage is done by one of four rusty spikes attached to a pitchfork. And for an encore, it punctures the sole of Mitch's boot and strikes blacktop so hard that the metal shaft rings inside his skin and he topples in a scream of of pain. The switchblade flies out of his hand. The road comes up and whacks him like a black tsunami. Mitch's scream evaporates as the wind is knocked out of him and he sucks a deep breath and another scream is right there filling up his mouth because the pitchfork's heavy handle is levering as gravity drives it earthward, and that metal spike is twisting simultaneously in Mitch's ankle and his foot. The wooden handle slaps the roadbed, sending another sharp vibration through the pitchfork. Mitch nearly blacks out. He bites his lip and rolls onto his side. It's a hell of a mess. A rusty spike has torn a couple of holes in him, And just for gravy, one of the Spike's neighbors is locked around the inside of his ankle and his foot. He knows he should yank out the fork and try to stand, but he can't seem to get moving any better than a turtle that's been rolled on its back. And that's not the worst of it. The October boy is standing about 15 feet away, right in the middle of the road, staring straight at him. The Chrysler's Gorgon headlights reveal the thing clearly, just as they reveal the gleaming butcher knife that feeds stiletto-like through the knotted vines that comprise its left hand, filling it as long fingers wrap around its hilt. And seeing that, you know exactly how Mitch feels. He's belly to the ground, staring up at a legend. It's like staring up at Santa Claus or the goddamn Easter Bunny, but only if Santa was the kind of guy who'd strangle you with your own stocking. 
and only if the Easter Bunny was the kind of rabbit who'd stop you dead and peel your cracked skull cop for like a, like a hard-boiled egg. Yeah, you remember how it feels to go nose to nose with a legend. That's why the stories they spin about the October boy are all about fear. You heard them around a campfire out in the woods when you were a kid, and they were whispered to you late at night in your dark bedroom when your best friend spent the night and they scared you so bad tending out in your backyard one summer night that you thought you wouldn't sleep for a week. So there's not much chance of separ separating reputation from reality when you look the real deal straight in the face. He's the October boy, the reaper that grows in the field, the merciless trick with a heart made of treats, the butchering nightmare with the hacksaw face, and he's going to get you. That's what they always told you. He's going to get you so you know you've been God. Just ask Miss Crenshaw if, you're, if you've got any doubt about that, because the October boy's stalking towards him now, and there's a mutant fire glowing behind his eyes that looks like it could melt the lead lining off a bomb shelter door. That fire, it's bottled up Hiroshima. It's 150 proof Nagasaki, and there's so much more to it than what it is or what Mitch believes it to be that he can barely stand to look at it. Mitch closes his eyes for just a second. He tries to move, but can't. He hears the October boy's wisp room footsteps. And for him, that's the only sound in the world. There's nothing else out there in the night. Bud is gone. Charlie's dead at the side of the road. He'll never make another sound. The last two realizations get Mitch moving. He grabs the pitchfork handle and yanks. The spike exits his foot and leg in electric jolt of pain. If he can use the fork to stand up, that's a start. The Chrysler's right behind him. If he makes it onto his feet, he can lean against the hood, maybe balance that way, maybe even manage to defend himself. And the October boy tears the pitchfork out of Mitch's hands. He cracks the pommel of the butcher knife against Mitch's jaw. Again, Crenshaw goes down hard his spine ratcheting against the Chrysler's front bumper as his ass finds its blacktop destination. The boy squats in front of him, his eyes still blazing with that mutant fire Mitch can't even comprehend. And the blade of the butcher knife comes up and fills the space between their faces. And the October boy's carved mouth chews over a single word. Keys. <laughs> It takes a second for the word to register in Mitch's brain. And then he digs his car keys out of his pocket and hands them over. The October boy's fingers vine around them like they're a fistful of sunshine. And he stands and walks around the side of the Chrysler. And the driver's door creaks open. You'd better move, the October boy says. You're in my way. The car door slams. The engine starts. The front bumper rattles Mitch's backbone. Jesus Christ, but Mitch moves then, away from that thresher of a bumper, out of the path of those brutal firestones. He's crawling across blacktop as the October boy hits the gas. The stink of burning rubber fills the air. Mitch rolls down the embankment into a muddy ditch at the side of the road. An exhaust cloud follows him, settling low to the ground. Mitch lays there in the darkness. He doesn't look up. The Chrysler growls into the night. A wind rises, sowing through the corn as if chasing the big black machine, digging its way down the, drain, the drainage ditch. Hamburger wrappers churn under its breath, but it doesn't last long. And then it's quiet. The stars shine down. The wind doesn't even whisper. For a time, for a little while. And then somewhere further down the ditch, a frog starts up. It's the first frog Mitch has heard all, heard all night. He's forgotten that there are frogs out here. And then another joins in, and another, and another. And it turns out Mitch isn't alone in the darkness. There are frogs all around him in that muddy old ditch. They were right here all along, clinging to the shadows like a silent audience. Dozens of them, maybe even a hundred. And Mitch didn't know they were here at all, because they were smart enough to be quiet smart enough to keep their little yap shut when a two-legged legend came walking down the road. Mitch buries his face in his hands, listening to those frogs work over the silence. Yeah, they're sure talking now, he thinks. And then he laughs, because it really is kind of funny. 
They don't waste any time running their mouths once their little green asses are safe. Not when they've got something to talk about. Not when they're telling a story. <laughs>